and he still uh, Oh, English word. <laughs> I am Vládia Zeman. I am pastor of the Baptist Church in Vysoké Mito in Czech Republic. I've been pastoring there for 13 years now. And 11 years ago, uh, we met a bunch of uh, great people from Chapel Street Church. They came for mission trip. And from that time, really something happened very good to our church team from your church came uh, to do English camps with us. Uh, they came to reach youth and we do it for 10 years now and we saw many, many uh, people who changed their lives uh, through this ministry. I remember one guy, 16 years old, he came uh, and he said, I am atheist and he came to Convince, convince us that God doesn't exist. He was 16 years old and he saw us like we talk together how we behave each other with Americans and Czechs. Uh, he saw for, for first time church and after two years he decided to receive Christ. And now after 10 years he's youth leader in our church, so it's a big change. A year ago uh, we started to build new sanctuary, which is downstairs uh, in our yard. Maybe you don't believe it, but we still meet in the first floor, which is uncomfortable, it's not good. But uh, we had the yard and we just started to build new sanctuary in that yard. And it will be two times bigger and it will help us to do new things which we couldn't do before in our church. People don't go to the churches because they are afraid of, of churches. And if we open this space to people and they can go there for some, let's say, concert or for, for some culture event, then they are open to go there during the Sunday morning. Just simple idea that we are growing, it's uh, changing minds uh, in people's lives in our town. Because, you know, in Czech, Czech, Czech Republic, churches are declining, and suddenly when you have somewhere, some, some church which is growing, people are asking what's happening there. And uh, I, I can see that uh, some people change their minds just because they heard that there is something growing. We have now uh, one guy, 50 years old, who became Christian two years ago. He never wanted to come to the church, but then he came, he found that it's something completely different. And uh, we started our building process. And he was just new Christian. When he saw it, uh, how we want to finish it, how we want to build on it, he, he started to be involved in that. And he suddenly found that he needs to give some money to it because he said it's our church. So suddenly he gave more money than everyone else. Then he had uh, his own home, which was not uh, done because he himself was in, in a reconstruction, building a re reconstruction. So he stopped it and he started to work on church building. <laughs> and when we were almost done, he said, and when we finish building process in church, I will finish my home and I will do home group in my, my home because I, I want to serve to God. And it was because he was involved in this building reconstruction and lots of things change in his life because of this, because he saw that, that we want to grow, we want to serve God, we want to share gospel and he catch it and he said, I want to do it too. This is something what surprised me too, because I didn't know how, how reconstruction can change lives. But when I saw him, like he, like he was involved and then started to think about God's work, God's mission, I was completely surprised. You know, uh, for us, this building process is a big deal. And we, we couldn't do it without your help to see your church, how you work, and how we can work in the future. Yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. I know Pastor Vladia. I was on that trip 11 years ago, our first trip there when we were doing English camp. I've been going back for a decade. Uh, I haven't, but our teams from our church have. Seeing young people come to Christ 
uh, in an English camp. They want to speak English. They want to learn the English language and practice it. And in doing so, they build relationships with Christians. That church is exploding in Viso Comito, this little village, little town in the Czech Republic. Nobody's writing about that in the news, but he's, I hope you could hear what Pastor Vladi has said. A brand new believer who's building his own home says, hold up, time out. We're not building my home until we build God's home. And he <laughs> gives radically to God's work there, and they're seeing people come to Christ left and right. And, it's, and, and, and you might wonder, well, what do we have to do with that? This is one of our Serve the World partners, and so when you give towards Serve the World, uh, it goes to meet the needs of our global partners, locally and globally, and the church in Biso Comito is one of those. And so he, this, we asked him, could you... Could you tell us a little bit about what God's doing there and say and a th- like a thank you video to share? And so I think he, he really, I teared up when I, re- when I saw him talking about that, in his, even in his own in his language, right? He says, when people see the church is in decline, nobody goes to church in the Czech Republic. It's a heavily atheistic country. And suddenly there's this church growing. They go, well, well something's happening there. What's going on there? You're right, something is happening there. The gospel's alive there. So thank you to all of you from Pastor Vladia and all of the people in his church. Uh, they're, they're partners, even though you've never met them. Um, about two years ago, we preached a series of sermons called Uncomfortable Grace. And I share with you author Paul David Tripp. He, he defines uncomfortable grace in this way. He says, God wants to take you where you don't want to go to do things in your life that could happen no other way. I love that definition. God wants to take you somewhere you really don't want to go in and of yourself for a purpose, to do something in you that's not going to happen any other way. That fits perfectly with our series right now called The Disciplines of Grace, where we're talking about what does it mean to discipline ourselves, train ourselves, or be trained by the grace of God. Sometimes they're easy and fun, like the discipline of gratitude. Make gratitude lists. Some of you took that challenge a few weeks ago and are still doing that, I hope. Beginning your day with gratitude. Or ending your day with thinking about where you noticed God. But sometimes when it comes to disciplines of grace, God wants to take us where we really don't want to go. Or what's hard for us, to do something in us that could happen no other way. And that's especially true and appropriate when we talk about the discipline of grace today. We talked about gratitude, we talked about noticing, and today we talk about the discipline of generosity or giving. Giving, money, generosity, this is one of those topics where I think we all agree in principle. (laughs) But we just tend to have our guard up when it gets personal. When it starts to, you know, become too specific. Whoa, 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 time out. Or maybe you grew up in a uh, church environment where it, it was just guilt all the time. I talked to one guy who said, I, I, I don't like coming to church because I expect to feel guilty and to be, feel uh, obligated to give. But we're not trying to make you feel either of those things. However, it's irresponsible for us not to talk about this if we're talking about disciplines of grace, those disciplines that help us live in the grace of Jesus, the things in our lives that we do that help us become like Christ, it would be glaring omission if we didn't talk about generosity. Of the 38 parables Jesus told in the gospel, 16 of them have to do with money and our attitude toward it. One out of every 10 verses in the gospels deals with wealth, money, and generosity. There are 500 verses on faith and 2,000 on money. Jesus apparently thought it was worth discussing. If you're going to be serious about growing the grace of Jesus Christ and learning and become more like him, then this is just not an issue you can afford to ignore. Me either. Timothy Keller, author and pastor in New York City, writes, there can be no genuine spiritual growth unless your money and your attitude towards it are placed in God's hands. I love that statement. He's right. This is the thing, right? This is the issue. And if you're a squirming right now, if you're thinking, oh, it's the money talk, maybe that's, part, that's like, you know, point and lesson. If you went to your doctor and you said, doctor, I'm not feeling well. I'm not sleeping well. I don't, I don't, I have aches and pains. Uh, I just am not, I haven't, I get sick really easily. I just don't feel right. And your doctor wanted to talk to you. He would naturally ask you questions uh, like, well, tell me about your diet. Tell me about your stress levels at work. Tell me about your relationships. He'd want to know more than just like the, he would ask stuff about your life. And what if you said, hey, whoa, whoa, time out, doc. That's really personal. Just stick to the medical stuff. Just make me feel better. He would say, rightly so, or she would say, rightly so, I can't help you unless we're not going to talk about those things. I can't offer you any help here unless you're going to talk because you're a whole person. 
It's as if Jesus is saying to us, you want to talk about growing in grace? We got to talk about this. I got to talk to you about this. So I'm asking to lay aside whatever defense mechanisms you might have, whatever objections you might have or presuppositions you might have, and maybe God has something to say for us that we need to hear. You can't say, I want more of God in my life, but I don't want to talk about my money. It doesn't work that way. There are three things in the New Testament that always pop up repeatedly uh, as kind of like the critical litmus tests for how you know you're understanding and growing the grace of Jesus Christ. First is your ability to forgive others. If you're not a forgiving person, that's a good indication you're not growing in grace. Second is your willingness to serve others. If you can't be generous with your time and, get, and serve those who aren't like you, it's a pretty good indication you're not growing in grace. And third, your willingness to be generous to others. So if you can't forgive, you can't serve, and you can't give, that's, those are pretty good indications that you've got issues about growing in grace. You might intellectually say, I believe in God and I trust Jesus, but it's not evident. It's not playing itself out. There's a block somewhere. There are many passages to choose from in the Bible, as I mentioned before, but we're going to go to Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, the church living in ancient, ancient Corinth, this is a wealthy port city on the Aegean Sea. It's a rival to Athens in the ancient world. It was an important trade route, and, uh, and the, there was a number of house churches there. And Paul writes two letters to the church in Corinth, 1 and 2 Corinthians, if you're new to the Bible. We're going to pick up this part of the second letter. This is probably one of the longest and most developed passages on generosity in the New Testament. We'll read just a couple of sections. First, chapter uh, 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and I, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. And I can't read this anymore. I know. <laughs> Ta-da. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, there it is, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Paul's amazing. This is actually a fundraising letter, at least this part of his letter. You know what's going on here? Here's the context. Paul is writing in part to encourage the church, and then part of his letter is to raise money for Christians living in Jerusalem who are experiencing a famine. They're starving. He's writing to rich Christians in Corinth who are mostly non-Jewish. They're Gentiles. They didn't grow up Jewish. Asking these rich, rich Christians in Greece who are not Jewish to give money to support poor Christians who are, did grow up Jewish in Jerusalem. This is not an easy task. You rich people, I want you to give me money to support people who, you're, who you don't know are not like you far away. And how does he do it? He appeals to the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why we call it a discipline of grace. When you read through chapter 8 and 9, you notice that Paul is urging, pleading, but he, not, he is not commanding them. Did you catch him say this? I, I'm not saying this is a command. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to. In, in chapter 9, verse 7, he says, not under compulsion. This is a theme right throughout the New Testament. Let me ask this question. Where does generosity start? Where does generosity start? Do you ever watch the original Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Where is fancy bread? In the heart or in the head? Am I the only one that knows that quote? <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> Where does it start? Most of us think generosity starts when I have saved enough, when I have paid off this bill, when I get sort of more security, when we get to a certain point, then I can be generous. I fall into this trap. It's not so. Why doesn't Paul just say, look, these people are starving, you're rich, this is your Christian duty, so fork it over. 
<laughs> he doesn't write it that way, does he? Not at all. Because from God's perspective, generosity is entirely a matter of the heart. It's all about your heart. That's where generosity begins, right in here. Think about it. How do you know if you're being generous? How do you know? What's the amount that you can say, okay, if I give this much, I'm in the safe zone. I'm generous now. What's the number? There isn't one for most of us. Some of you might be thinking, oh, wait a second. I think there's something in the Bible about a, t a tithe, right? Isn't there a law about the tithe? Doesn't the Old Testament teach a tithe? The tithe is an is a, is a Aramaic, Hebrew Aramaic word that means it's a tenth. And it was a law in the Old Testament that God's people, the Israelites, were to give a tenth, 10% 10 of their first fruits to God's work in the temple, tabernacle temple, and the work of the priests to give it away to charity to the poor and to the work of God. But it's very interesting. First of all, do you know how much the average person, churchgoer in America gives? Average. Present company, of course, excluded. 2.5%. It's very intriguing that Paul never once mentions this tithe law, this 10% law. And when Jesus mentions it in the New Testament, the Gospels, he uses it like in terms of rebuking the Pharisees. In Luke chapter 11, he says, you tithe religiously, but you ignore the justice and love of God. So I think we can make this inference. Even the 10%, which was really an assumed starting point for God's people, is not a, it's not like, okay, okay, just get to, like, it's kind of like the old question I used to get asked when I was youth pastor by students, mostly guys. How far can I go with a girl and still be safe, like, in terms of my sexual purity? How far is too far? It's the wrong question. It's how, how can I bless her and encourage her to become more like Jesus? So if we're thinking, well, what's the number at which I, okay, now I'm, now I'm done, now I'm generous. It's the wrong question. I think that's one of the reasons we aren't given it that way. It's always a matter of the heart. I want to show you a little, a short video clip from a website called Generous Living, where a number of people lay out the heart of generosity. Let's watch this together. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God so loved the world that he gave his son. That is such an overwhelming and humbling thought to me. Anything we have to give, we've received first. Because Jesus said, you know, freely have you received, now freely give. And so this whole sense of, you know, of completely being able to receive, can we then on the other side have the ability uh, to be generous? When I think about that God gave first and how that, and how that affects my giving is, well, it's not mine. I mean, he gave it, and he gave it to pass along. When I think about him, when I think about him giving it all up, it's like, how could I not be part of doing that with him out of worship and love to him? Since I love God, and I want other people to know his love, the easiest way to do that is through giving. Because when you give a gift to someone, it's, it's like opening the door to their heart to then give them the ultimate gift of Jesus Christ. I really see how when he tells us to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. When we do for others, it releases us from becoming self-focused and self-centered and self-indulgent. I marvel that he would allow me and, and would want to use me to help be a part of what he gives and how he gives. I think they articulated probably better than I could. The heart of generosity. Where does it start? And an understanding of who God is and what he's done. He gave first. So I'll put it this way. Unless your attitude and my attitude toward our, my money, toward your money, and giving it away is increasingly joyful and desiring to give more, then my heart is not truly generous. How do you know if you're generous? Are you joyful? And are you thinking about how can I be more generous? That's the way you know. 
So there is a number. Would you like to know the answer? There's a line. Would you like to know the answer? How much do I have to give? Would you like to know? I'll tell you right now. Would you like to know? Everybody, who would like to know? Here's the answer. More. <laughs> I know. Great. Pastor, saying more. I, we already took the offering. It's not this. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying like that, that's for our heart's sake. Are you growing? It's a progression. I want to be more. When did, did God say, for God so loved the world that he gave 10%, but then he said, that's enough for you people. No, gave all himself fully, freely. I want to be like him. Again, this is, please don't hear this as some sort of arm-twisting guilt about giving to the church. We're talking about disciplines of grace. How does a man or woman become more like Jesus Christ and living in his grace? This is one of the key issues in our culture. It's like the last frontier for many of us. It's the whole place we hold out. So the only way to be sure your heart is not shrinking into self-centered greed is to be increasing in joyful generosity of all kinds. Let's talk about how generosity grows. How does generosity grow? Paul begins chapter 8, you might recall this, by uh, giving them a, an example, a case study. He begins chapter 8 when he says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, the Macedonian churches were different than the, the Corinthians in that they were not a port city. They were inland Greece, very poor by comparison. And Paul says, basically, when I went to them, he, I wasn't asking for much because they're so poor. They're barely above the poverty line themselves. But they begged and pleaded, he says in his letter, that they would be included in the ability to give. They gave way more than we expected. They gave out of their poverty. The Macedonian churches, he says, gave joyfully, freely, and abundantly, even beyond their means, even begging to be able to give. I haven't encountered that too often. People begging to be able to give. I don't do that very often. This is the picture of generosity, of God's heart. Harvard economist Juliet Shore wrote a book called The Overspent American. She writes, 70% of households making over $100,000 a year disagree with this statement. I can buy everything I really need. Did you hear that? 70% of American households that make more than $100,000 a year disagree with the statement, I can buy everything I really need. That means that the richest people in the richest country in the world believe they cannot afford to buy what they need. The lie is to believe that we can start being generous once we get to a certain point. It's the ever-receding horizon. It never comes. When I get there, when I get there, when I get there, this paid off, kids out of college, get, then, I, get, then, I will, then I will. It doesn't begin when you get there. It begins in here. Just like the Christians in ancient Corinth, we can take a lesson of generosity from poorer churches in other parts of the world. Jennifer, in, in, in a moment ago, in the offering moment, mentioned some of our people, our students and, and adults serving in different parts of the, of the world right now. In Ecuador, some back from Mexico. One of the reasons we send students to serve on missions projects like this is not just for the work that they do and the good they do. They do a lot of good and a lot of work and we, they bless these ministries. It's also for the seeds planted in their hearts because they're growing up in the affluent suburbs of Chicago. They're going to be the halves of the world, the richest one half of 1%. If going to Ecuador can change their value system just a little bit and they begin to see the world differently, it'll have kingdom impact. When they see people who have exponentially less than they do, joyfully serving and giving, it changes you. It impacts you. My wife and I flew to uh, Africa to visit one of our uh, partners with Cure in Zambia, Cure Hospital in Zambia. We had a layover in Dubai. Anybody been to Dubai? First of all, it's so hot, it's stupid. It's crazy hot. 10 o'clock at night, it's like a punch in the face. You get off the plane, it's, like, oh, it's crazy hot. <laughs> And then, and then it's like, the, it's, a, it's the desert. It's, I mean, I'm, it's like the Discovery Channel desert. There's nothing there, sand, desert. And then there's this crazy city growing up out of the desert. And you know what they built it with? Oil money. Why? Because they could. The Burj Khalifa, tallest building in the world, they're like, ah, oh, let's build a taller one. They've got plans to build a bigger one. Why? Just because they can. And then you fly to Zambia, into Lusaka, and we go see Cure. Poverty like I hadn't experienced before. This juxtaposition is crazy. We're insulated from that sometimes here in the comfortable suburbs. We need to 
see the world differently and learn. I, I, we went to a worship service, my wife and I, with the Tubalenge congregation in the, in the bush of Zambia. It was like a two-hour bouncy Jeep ride to get to this church, and then we hiked back in there. It was a two-hour service, two-and-a-half-hour service. 35 minutes of it was the offering. They were dancing and singing and bringing their gifts down the aisles. We should try that. Woohoo! Wave, waving it around, you know, putting it in buckets and praising the Lord. And then distributing it to some poor people and celebrating what God gave them. It was beautiful and profoundly humbling. Pastor Brian and I were joking. We read about a church in Oklahoma that said, try giving for 90 days, and if God doesn't bless you, we'll give you your money back. <laughs> so we're going to try that. We want you to give for 90 days, and if you don't get blessed, the, uh, the church in Oklahoma will give you your money back. <laughs> totally kidding. That's weird. That's not the, it's not the premise here. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 9 now, verses 6 through 15. The Apostle Paul, this is the second half of his, his teaching on generosity, verse, beginning with verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and, and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. A couple of things I hope you caught in there. One is all the agricultural references. Did you hear all that? Seeds, sowing, harvest. And the second is how many times is grace and gospel mentioned? Paul is making, he's using the metaphor of, of, of a harvest and growing in agriculture, and he's also tying this back constantly to what Christ has done in us. Generosity begins like a seed of grace planted in the human heart because of what Jesus has done for you. And it grows as it's watered and nurtured in a relationship with Christ. Friends, your relationship with Jesus should change your relationship with your money. Your relationship with Jesus Christ should change your relationship to your stuff. If it's not, you need to think and pray about that. We need to. Why? Is this one of the areas, God, where you want to discipline me by your grace? You want to take me where I don't want to go to do in me something that could happen no other way? The truth is, most of us attach some level of identity, security, and worth to wealth. I don't think that money is actually our God, but I think, I'm convinced that money and what we do with it reveals the false gods in our lives. It shows us what we're really worshiping. What do you spend freely on, joyfully? No, no question, no problem. You don't, <laughs> I'll, sometimes I'll ask couples in premarital counseling, how much is okay to spend without checking with your spouse once you're married? I'll have them write it down on cards and then flip it over without telling each other. One time, no kidding, guy wrote, girl and guy did this, and she's from a single parent home, and he was from an affluent family in St. Charles, and they flipped their cards over, and one said 50 bucks, and one said 5,000. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, let's talk about this. <laughs> There's some expectation issues here. How we think about money. Your relationship with Jesus ought to change. Think about it. If we attach security, identity, comfort, if you're a spender, then some of your functional gods are status and, and, and significance. If you're a saver, then some of your functional gods are security and, and control. Same root issue. But if you're attaching security, control, significance, and status to your wealth, then it's really hard to give away your identity, security, status, and control, isn't it? 
But if your security, identity, status, and control are in Christ, it can't, you can't lose that. Then giving money away is different, a, a totally different thing. So I'm not attaching the wrong stuff to it. This is foundational to living a generous life. To know two things. My identity, security, control, and status are not in my wealth. And number two, I am not the owner. I am not the owner. Psalms tells us he owes a cattle on a thousand hills. And you are not your own, you're bought with a price. You don't even own yourself. It's all on loan. You're, you're money managers for God. Anybody ever visit a financial planner? Is anybody here a financial planner? <laughs> when you go visit it, my wife and I did this recently. We looking at retirement, starting to talk that way. I'm six months from 50. I don't like this, but I got to talk about the future. So we started planning and looking. What do the financial planners do besides try to sell you life insurance? They, the first thing they do is they ask you questions. What's important to you? What are your goals? What, what matters to you? What do you want your future to look like? Right? And the way you answer those questions is they set up different accounts and they give you advice on how to get there. Okay, think about it. If you're not the owner, but the money manager for God's resources, that's the right way to view your stuff. If, you're, if I'm not an owner, but I am a, a steward, a manager of what God gives me, then what should I be doing? Okay, God, what's important to you? Okay, God, what's you, what, what do you want the future to look like? What do you want me to do with your wealth, God? What do you... What do you what matters to you? Because it's not mine, it's yours. It's a whole different way to think. And I'm not preaching this as if I'm already there. I've got a lot of growing to do in this area. But think about that. If you're not the owner, you're the manager, our job is to be asking God the questions. What's important to you, God? Where is your heart, God? How should I invest what you have given me? Okay, let's last the question. What does generosity produce? Where does it start in your heart? How does it grow by relationship with Jesus? What does it produce? The phrase Paul uses here is a harvest of righteousness. What does that mean? Some people have used it like a prosperity gospel promise. What if I give to God and the church, then, then I'll get rich. <laughs> That's not at all what he's saying. It doesn't fit, fit the metaphor. Paul's quoting Psalm 112 verse 9 when he says, He will supply seed to the sower and bread for food. He's saying, you give to God's work and it produces something, a harvest of righteousness. Righteousness is the word for right relationship with, meaning we give to God's work and God's agenda is reconciling people to himself and to each other. Families being healed, sinners being forgiven, addictions being, people being set free from. We see these things. So in other words, let me give you an example. A Shepherd's Heart, uh, our umbrella ministry over our food pantry, benevolent ministry, and a number of other ministries under that, mini that, um, that, that term, Shepherd's Heart. It's not just the food pantry. It's so much more. There are budgeting teams. And I constantly hear stories from Aaron Wise, who's sitting right over there, who tells me stories of people, not just that get food or get their rent paid or get their utilities paid, or they, and, oh, they don't just find a job. They don't just get life skills. They come to know Jesus. In that relationship of material needs being met, their spiritual needs begin to be met. That's the harvest of righteousness. Paul's giving us a vision for the harvest. He's also giving us a vision for the Lord of the harvest, the vision for the Savior. Look at verse 15. Thanks be to God, he finishes, for his inexpressible gift. What is that? What is the inexpressible gift? Jesus is the inexpressible gift. And if you receive Jesus Christ as a gift, that's a seed of grace planted in your heart that grows and changes you and it changes your relationship to your stuff. It makes you a generous person. This is the heart of the gospel. You heard it in the video. For God so loved the world that he gave. The central act was an act of radical generosity on the one, behalf of the one who made us. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, you know you're going to receive everything you need and you have everything you need in Christ. In, in, in the passage I read at the beginning, chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you know. Do you know? Do you know his grace? I'm not talking about intellectually agree with. Do you know it? Has it penetrated your heart? This is where it begins. Paul is appealing to them on the basis of not obligation, not duty, not guilt. Not even the need. The appeal is, you know the grace of Jesus Christ. You know what's been given to you. You know how much you owe that you couldn't pay. And he paid it all. We should be the most generous, joyfully generous people. So if you find that your heart is not generous, perhaps it's because you don't know or you have forgotten the grace of Jesus Christ. When I, when I start feeling that way, it's a good indication, God, I think I'm forgetting. I think I'm starting to lose sight of who you are and what you've done. So what can we do? In Luke 12, 34, Jesus gives us a very simple statement, but it's a profound principle. I want to share it with you briefly and then give you a challenge because we're giving you a challenge each week, a discipline of grace for your life. Here's the principle. He says, where your treasure is, anybody know the last part? There what? Your heart will be also. You know it by heart, most of you. You've heard it before, even if you didn't know where it comes from. To the end of this parable of the rich fool, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Luke chapter 12, verse 34. Most of us, would, well, okay, that yeah, makes sense. Think about that for a minute. What's treasure? It's the Greek word mammon, money. Where your money, wealth, treasure is, where your stuff is, there what? Your heart is. Where does generosity start? In the heart. Most of us think that actually works the other way around. We think it works like this. My, where my heart is, that's where I'll put my treasure. Like what I really care about, that's where I'll put my wealth. That's generally true, but Jesus says, the, says it the opposite way around for a very important reason. He says where your treasure already is, that's where your heart's gonna be. Okay, if that's true. What if you're like me, sometimes you find your heart in the wrong place? What if sometimes you look, examine your own heart and you realize, you know what? I'm not growing in generosity. I am, do have a scarcity mindset. I am fearful of the future. I am worried about me and mine. What do you do? Hmm. <laughs> Anybody guess? Think of the principle now. If where my treasure is, that's where my heart is. And I look at my heart and I say, it's in the wrong place. What does that tell me? I got my treasure in the wrong place. What could I do about that? You could probably guess. Give. The simple discipline of grace is if you find your heart slipping in the wrong direction, give. Be generous. Put your, begin to put your treasure somewhere else. If you want to care about Apple as a company, buy some stock. You'll pay more attention to how the company's doing, I guarantee you, if you have money there. What do you do if you want to care more about the heart of God and the kingdom of God? Invest. Invest. It's a simple principle which you get in every other area of life. We sort of have these blinders on spiritually. So here's your generosity challenge for the week. Should you choose to accept it? I want you to do two things every day. Number one, I want you to examine your own heart in three categories. Am I joyful? In giving? Am I looking for opportunities to give? And am I humble? Am I giving meaning? Am I not? It's not, it's just between me and God. How joyful am I? How humble am I? And how eager am I? Okay, once you've done a little, little stock, take stock of your own heart, then here's the challenge. Look for ways this week to be secretly generous to somebody every day. It might be financial. It might be in some other way. Might be with your words or your time. But for the next seven days, take stock of your own heart and look for an opportunity to be secretly generous to another person. Now, I'm not saying write big checks to the church. We'll, of course, accept them if you do. <laughs> I'm saying take stock of your own heart and look for ways to be secretly generous to those around you in your life. Some of you, it'll be, it'll be obvious and easy. You know right now there's somebody in need and I can make a difference. You have no idea what that would mean. 
You know, you always hear these stories, right? People that pray, I, uh, we had a bill for $700, and I prayed and prayed and prayed, and then I went to the mailbox, and there was $701. You ever hear those kinds of stories? You think, how does that happen? How does that happen? I tell you what, it's not magic. God doesn't go, presto, change, envelope in the mailbox. It's somebody knows about that need, listens to the heart of God, and writes that check. You could be on the other end of that equation this week. You could be God blessing somebody, okay? Take stock of your own heart every day. Look for ways to be secretly generous every day and see what God does in this discipline of grace. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you and thank you for this. The central truth of our faith is a radical, life-changing, history-altering act of generosity that you saw the great need of the world and in our own hearts, a need that can be met no other way, a world lost and dying and hopeless, and you gave. You gave all. You gave your son Jesus. And he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich, and that in our wealth, spiritually and materially, we might be a blessing to others. Thank you that you've placed us in this church, in this community at this time. Forgive us for thinking that we own stuff. We don't. We are but your stewards. So Lord, by your grace, help us to examine our hearts and to look for opportunities to be your hands and feet of generosity this week and our whole lives. We pray in your name. Amen.